So thank uh, Ashwin and Pranav and ICTS for inviting me to be the chair for this session. Um, it's a great honor and prestige. Uh, so we are gathered here to know uh, Narsimhan and Sashadri, to honor in, the, in honor of Narsimhan and Sashadri, as is known, they have had long productive years, lives, played a fundamental role in the development of uh, post-independence mathematics and uh, proved a, path break, a landmark theorem and path-breaking work on the theory of vector bundles, creating with, with the work, the theory of vector bundles and, uh, uh, and also enjoyed great friendship for nearly 70 years. You know, they were students from 1949, but probably they got to know each other from 1953 when they joined the Tata Institute uh, and uh, very, really good friendship. So I just wanted to borrow a phrase from uh, from them itself in a conversation. I think uh, they were touched by divine grace, you know, this kind of uh, lives. So we are really here to celebrate their lives. So let us, uh, that's uh, what we have here. And our first speaker today is uh, my good friend, Vikraman Balaji from Chennai Mathematical Institute. Uh, as is well known, uh, Sashadri moved to Chennai in 1984 and Balaji joined him as a student in 1984. So they had the journey together for the last 20, 36 years. They have been uh, really together. It's been a really wonderful, uh, I think for both both of them, uh, both as a mentor, as a student. And, uh, uh, and then Balaji continued to become his collaborator and uh, playing a major role in the development of Chennai Mathematical Institute. You know, he was nurtured nurturing students and trying to and in building a vibrant atmosphere, mathematical atmosphere at CMI. Of course, uh, you know, from some conversations, I know that Sashadri took a very keen interest in his work and was immensely proud of Balaji's mathematical journey. So I invite now Balaji to uh, give his talk. It is uh, titled, I think, Parhauric Torsos and Degenerations of um, uh, Moduli of uh, moduli problems. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank the organizers for giving me this very special privilege to be able to talk uh, in honor of uh, uh, or in a session in honor of Seshadri and Narasimhan. It's a really a special privilege, and I must also thank uh, Rajan for his very gracious remarks. Uh, I've had a very, very um, special journey for the last 36 years. I mean, I sorely miss Sishadri's presence. Of course, Narsiman and I also, till January, we had even email correspondence regarding several things. Some of the talks that I gave about Sishadri and Narsiman was particularly curious to ask me about details. So till January, I had email uh, correspondence with him and uh, of this year. So I've had a very close um, interaction with both of them. Of course, with Sishadri, it was personal in many ways. and. Um, it's been a privilege to be to have been a student, his collaborator, and in some sense, I've tried to. I mean, I was kind of influenced by his. I would call it uh, uh, Rajin called it divine grace. I'll call it a spiritual atmosphere in mathematical sense. Nothing more than that. And uh, so it was a very special privilege to be a part of that. The and his to see Seshadri, a, a very abstracted mathematician, trying to develop an institution was also a great privilege. Um, it was a kind of a benevolent dictator in the very, in the very noble sense of the term, and he has done a great job there. And we, we look forward to carrying it on in future. So thanks a lot for giving me this privilege. So let me now share my screen for this, for this talk. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just... Do I, I need to close the, yeah okay so I'm going to talk about uh, a theme in which firstly I collaborated with uh, Sishadri which is the work on parahoric torsos and second part of the uh, talk I, I believe I have an hour and 15 minutes to talk is it correct hello hello yeah it's Balaji I suppose so but uh, yeah no, I wanted to know because an hour and 15 minutes, I'll, I mean, I'll try to. Yeah, fine, 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 yeah. So, so there are two parts to this talk. One is parahoric torsos, and the other is a, an, a, a very important part of Sishadi's work on degenerations of modelized spaces. 
something that is not all that well known. So I thought I'll give some importance to that, especially because I've also done some work. And moreover, the whole theme of uh, parahoric torsus uh, that we, we worked out was um, in some sense motivated by this problem on degenerations. So as we go along, um, I'll try to mention how these two themes intertwine and how uh, they are closely related to the work of Narsimhan Sishadri and, and their generalizations. So let me fix some basic notations for this. This is the first part of the talk, which is something that I did with Sishadi, which got published in 2015. But I did this work um, almost I mean, nine years back, nine to 10 years. Yeah. So uh, my, I work with my base field, which is a field of complex numbers. My G, uh, my group G will be an almost simple, simply connected, uh, connect, uh, connected algebraic group. G you can take as examples of the simple, special linear group the, uh, the, the, the other groups like the symplectic group or the exceptional groups like G2, uh, the E6, E7, E8, and all those groups, basically from the classification. So um, let me just start with my basic notations here. Let Phi be a Fuchsian group. It's a group of SL, SL2R uh, acting on the upper half space, a Fuchsian group of the so-called elliptic type I don't want to describe these things. This is, it has two G generators, A1, A2, AG, G, B1, B2, BG, and a bunch of elements with a finite order, C1, C2, CM, acting on the upper half space with a single relation um, among the uh, commutators and the product of CIs, which is product of AI, AJ, BJ, C1, C2, CM is identity. and Ci to the power Ni is identity. Ni are the orders of these elements. And let uh, Q be the quotient map from the upper half space to X. X is now my upper half space modulo this group pi that I've written up there. And for some reason, I'm assuming genus is bigger than or equal to two, but I mean, it's because I'm working with the upper half space. But for many of the results that I'm going to talk about, um, it really doesn't matter. We'll have to just fix the, the points R which, we, which I'm going to talk about now to be sufficiently uh, large in number for if you want to work with P1 or the elliptic curve. So let me assume that genus is bigger than or equal to two. And this, this uh, quotient, this map is ramified over a subset R of X. There, and uh, the isotropy groups at the points uh, at, these, at some ZI, which is the inverse image of this R, they are these generated by these finite order elements, CIs, that I've put in my Fuchsian group pi. OK, so see, R is my set of ramifications here. So let me make a definition which, in history, goes back to, I believe, on Andre Weyer's work in 1938. The type of a homomorphism from pi to G, of course, Andre Weyer works only in G equals GLN case, which is, as Seshadri would always call it, the basic case. The type of a homomorphism from pi to G is defined with a set of conjugacy classes in G of the images of these finite order elements CI. And uh, I, de I denote this uh, type by uh, a tuple of, uh, of M, M tuple or M tuple tau i, I'm just calling it tau, equivalently the type of this, of this homomorphism is the isomorphism classes of the, of the local representations at the stabilizers to G. So that's the type of a homomorphism. And this is the kind of topological datum which one wants to fix uh, in, the, in the study that was uh, started by, uh, firstly, by Narsiman and Sishadri. In the case of Narsiman and Sishadri theorem, pi just happens to be the, the fundamental group of the Riemann surface. Which <clears throat> so as I just wanted to mention, uh, in the Narsiman Sishadri theorem, the basic group is the group pi is the fundamental group pi one of x, but we don't have these CIs. So we just have the 2G generators with the commutator relation. And, uh, but in the paper of Narsimhan Sishadri itself, they do consider when they want to understand vector bundles of non-zero degree, which, be, which is absolutely essential for their and their so-called very interesting inductive argument that they use to prove their basic theorem. They do require um, a, a, a certain types of groups where at least you know one uh, extra generator is used to handle the the degree part, of that, which is a, an element which is a central element 
uh, and uh, they use that to uh, handle problems of non-zero degree. And so in some sense, the general Fuchsian group story had already begun in the paper of Nasim and Sishalti. The, uh, the object of study that we are looking at is the, the, the space of homomorphisms. Now KG for me is the, uh, I fix a maximal compact subgroup of G. And I'm looking at homomorphisms from pi to KG where I fix this type, the, I fix the isomorphism classes of the, the local representations or the conjugacy classes of these images rho CIs. So this is my space and I'm always modulo, all, all these are modulo conjugacy action by KG. So I'm interested in conjugacy classes of representation or homomorphisms. <clears throat> the aim, uh, this is the basic aim in the Narsim and Seshadri theorem, later on developed by Seshadri and then Mehta Seshadri is to describe the space of representations, both in as a space and as well as in some sort of categorical terms as objects on the Riemann surface X, which is the quotient of the upper half space model of this group pi. And um, in uh, this uh, theorem, in this general setting of uh, Fuchsian groups, different from the fundamental group, that is where the number of generators is arbitrary and the CIs are non-central elements. This was achieved by Sishadri in a paper called Pi Bundles. This was uh, after Narsim and Sishadri had proved their basic theorem. And this is of course in the case of G equal to GLN, Sishadri was interested in vector bundles in those days. So this is the paper on Pi Bundles where Sishadri more generalizes all aspects of the Narsim and Sishadri theorem. But uh, the, the condition that the Fuchsian group is of an elliptic type plays an important role here. Of course, the later, I have also for simplicity assumed that, um, that these elements are of finite order. In general, you could have uh, Fuchsian groups not necessarily of elliptic type, but of parabolic type where the, uh, the element CI is not, are not necessarily of finite order. The methods that Seshadri used in 1968 uses the elliptic part of the theory. And therefore, in some sense, he did not carry on much farther to describe these, uh, the, the, uh, the, the objects on the other side as, as vector bundles on X in complete detail. He had some idea, I believe, in personal remarks he told me, but he was always unsure of what he called the properness result of proving the projectivity of the modelized space. So somewhere it was in sort of a, it was kept in abeyance for several years. And then Vikram Mehta joined uh, TIFR towards the late 70s. I believe that Sishadi, I mean, Sishadi had some sort of a properness proof in his five bundle paper, but the, he, he was not, there was some aspect of the model like construction which he was not very happy with. So I, that had to be done completely. And then Mehta Sishadi wrote this famous paper on vector models with parabolic structures, where this group with this uh, space R tau pi kg, k of kg now will be the unitary group in this case is completely described in terms of vector bundles on X with uh, which are with fixed rank and degree and also which have flag structures at the marked points, which are the images of these points, ZI, the ramification locus R that I spoke about here, uh, this set R here. Okay, so <laughs> a pi, so just to give you some sort of a quick idea how this construction uh, proceeds, so you, a pi G bundle on the upper half space is, uh, is defined to be, is taken to be the trivial bundle where the action of this group pi is given as gamma of Z, or G, Z comma G in terms of rho gamma G on the, on the second factor. So that's a pi G bundle on the upper half space. And when G equal to GLN is a full linear group, uh, these are pi vector bundles because there's an equivalence between principal GLN bundles and vector bundles. And so you can simply take V to be H cross CN in this case. And we can take what is called the invariant push forward now, because we have no, you can have a sheaf theoretic uh, setting here and uh, a vector bundle is a locally free sheaf. And I can take the direct image with, and take the invariant sections there. So this was the invariant direct image, which is already in some sense uh, goes way back to Andre Weiss paper. And when uh, the theorem of uh, Narsimhan Sishadri and also the theorem of Mehta Sishadri, basically the object on the other side is this vector bundle. The hard part is to prove that there is an equivalence of categories or an isomorphism of spaces. And uh, the parabolic structure, because the, this Fuchsian group is, of, uh, is not the fundamental group, the, the uh, Sishadri's 
Mehta Sishadi's beautiful observation is that you you recover you you obtain flag structures uh, at the marked points for these vector bundles along with the data of weights. So a parabolic structure on a vector bundle is a, is is given by uh, a vector bundle on the Riemann surface with some markings together with flag structures at each of those points along with a, a flags means that a five, at each of the points v x i s you have a flag of subspace, and uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, the along the, the flags also carry weights, uh, which are numbers between zero and one, which satisfy some conditions. I'm not going into those technical details, but that's what a vector bundle with the parabolic structures was, and then. Um, Mehta and Sishadri also define the notion of semi-stability for such vector bundles, and they prove that uh, this space uh, R pi, which I spoke about here, R tau pi kg, modulo the action of uh, kg by by inner conjugation, is uh, the space of uh, um, is the um, modulized space of um, semi-stable parabolic bundles with a specified weight, and the weight uh, data of the weight comes. Precisely by the declaration of these conjugacy classes uh, uh, tau i that I mentioned here. So the invariant direct image, therefore, this gives a full faithful embedding of the category of pi vector bundles on H into the category of uh, parabolic vector bundles. And uh, uh, here, as is what I've mentioned, this elliptic response concept makes it the vector bundle to have so-called rational weights. So if you want to work with Vector bundles with real weights, you have to allow for so called parabolic fixed points, and that is also achieved in the Mehta Seshatri paper. Okay, so with a very brief introduction of what happens in the vector bundle setting, let me go to the, towards the general G case, which is the main object of my paper with Seshadri. Uh, and so here I fix uh, uh, some data which is going to uh, help me parameterize my modelized spaces. So, um, uh, if you, you, I'm working with a, 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 a compact group now, not necessarily the unitary group, and one knows that the set of conjugacy classes of elements of the of this compact group gets identified with the torus model of the Weyl group, and this is the so-called uh, Weyl alcove. And when G is simple, um, one can talk about the so-called affine Weyl group, uh, which is like a semi-direct product of the Weyl group. With the uh, the core root lattice there, and this uh, the affine Weyl group acts. Um, I mean, you have these affine um, linear functionals, and the alcoves become the fundamental domain. I mean, for the action of the Weyl, uh, affine Weyl group, and in the case when G is simple, this um, alcove in fact is a, is a is a simplex. I'm also talking about the rational Weyl alcove. That means I'm interested only in the rational points of the alcove. So these parameterize, you know, one Yt stands for the the one parameter subgroups uh, T is my maximal torus in my group G. Uh, and uh, so this, uh, the alpha naught is technically the so-called highest root and uh, this alcove uh, is, uh, is uh, prescribed by this data. It's, a, uh, it's something sitting, um, it's like an alcove inside the wild chamber with a, with, a, with a wall defined by the alpha naught. Okay, so this, is a, is the basic is the basic uh, space which is going to parameterize the objects which we were going to study. So I started off uh, abruptly on the journey for G because uh, the the case of the the general case of G has uh, very different flavors to the from the the linear case for various reasons as I'll mention in the, in the course of the talk. So the elements of finite order, and as we noticed, we were always interested in the space R tau pi kg, and I'm going to fix these conjugacy classes of the images of the CIs. These are all elements of finite order. So the elements of finite order in kg modulo conjugacy, they get identified with the rational points of the Weyl alcove, which is the reason why I, why I work with the YT tensor Q. And um, I'm just giving some description of the alcove, but that's not important. So you can have, uh, nice descriptions of the Weyl alcove. Um, but more importantly, uh, I just now, I, from now on, I work with this, this real vector space, uh, Yt tensor R of Z. Yt is a lattice there, which is uh, one parameter subgroups in this case. And so E is a vector space of dimension L, where I should have mentioned L is the uh, rank of the group G. So 
one by in the, in the technical terms one can identify this vector space e with the so called affine apartment of the bruhartrich building of the group g <clears throat> so i'm going in a reverse order so i'm fixing the torus now so i should have been fixed earlier so the maximal torus t b is the borel subgroup and g is my group g b should should stand for the upper triangular matrices and t the diagonal matrices and l is the rank of the group g which is the dimension of the maximal torus and xt stands for the characters and there is this bracket stands for the canonical bilinear form between the one parameter subgroups and the characters <clears throat> uh let me also fix uh my spaces a which is the uh, formal power series ring in one variable spec kt and capital k to be the laurent series of the function field or the quotient field of this uh, uh of this of kt which is a k round bracket t uh i'm interested in uh, so called loop group picture where i'm going to look at morphisms from uh, capital k to uh, the group g so my um, i i'm not trying to motivate anything i'm just want to give the flavor of the main results so for for each theta in this uh, affine apartment that i have fixed this vector space e let p theta k so when i talk about gk this group gk should be thought of as in the matrices with entries in the field kt which are allowed to have uh, poles of some order and so uh, gk i mean is is, a, is an abstract group here but uh, one could always keep the image of a, mat a matrix with entries in k round bracket t and um, p theta k is a subgroup of uh, of this group gk which is what is called a bounded uh, an, an example of a bounded group in the sense that the order of poles is bounded and the typical the definition um, there is a typo here so this this mr theta the bracket of theta should go up it is mr theta as an exponent of z p theta k is a group generated by the torus the a value point of the torus by a value point of the torus i mean you look at uh, diagonal entries which are uh, formal power series with only greater than or equal to zero uh, powers of t and the root the the the, the ur the so called root groups with uh, with entries um um which, which are um i should have there's no z here there should be a t the the parameter is t it's not a z here so sorry about that so it is t to the power mr theta a where mr theta is uh, the greatest integer function mi minus of that With the theta comma r, where this is the pairing between the one-parameter subgroups and the, the characters. So, uh, so, um, so, so this is the definition. Of, this is the groups that we are interested. I mean, we may. I'm not since I'm not trying to motivate. I will see how these come up, and I'll give some examples of these groups, uh, uh, which will be na natural examples here. Since the group G is simple and simply connected by assumption. Uh, these groups that i have listed here you know this is a finite collection of groups in fact uh, I, i want to say that all the so called parahoric subgroups of gk i mean these groups are what are called the parahoric subgroups of gk and uh, one could even take points in the so called rational while alco so i don't need to take real points of e but the, even rational points to parameterize them so up to isomorphism the, the groups that i'm interested in are this this list of groups and uh, i could even uh, work with rational points of the while alco i mean which is a very small set and one could even further go down and say that i mean the entire list is essentially prescribed by looking at facets of the while alco so uh, there are 2 to the power uh, l plus 1 i mean you can just all the facets of the while alco is what's going to index the set of parahorics which are so these are the parahoric groups that we are interested in and uh, these groups play, play a very important role in arithmetic and uh, the 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 nice thing is that they they come up here i as we go along in the talk i'll tell you how we uh, came up with this uh, this business so let me for the sake of uh, i mean completeness and it's always good to have a few examples in mind uh, look at parahorics in the group sl2 so sorry my my uniformizer is changing sometimes it's z and sometimes it's t so Take z equal to t through the lecture. So my group p theta alpha 
the, this is this kind of distinguished maximal parahoric in SL2. There are two maximal parahorics. One is the group SL2A itself, which means all entries are formal power series with no polar terms. Or you could have a, a, a matrix of this kind where the entries of A's are, poly, are power series, but you have a pole of order, order one on the upper triangular entry and a zero of uh, order one in the lower triangle. This is one of the so-called maximal parahorics. Note that SL2 is rank one, so it's like a, the alcove is a, is a segment. So apart from this, there is also the so-called Iwahori group, which is the, which I'll mention here now, which you can look at groups where you can put, you can remove the Z inverse terms. You can have A, A, A on the upper triangle and a Z, A below. So this group is uh, such that when you put Z equal to zero, you, you get the upper triangular matrices. So it's, it's like the, if you specialize from this group to, uh, to the, uh, the underlying SL2 by putting, evaluating Z equal to zero, you get the Borel, the upper triangular matrices. Likewise, if you look at the group SL3, so one of the so-called maximal parahorics looks like this. In the upper triangular entries, I have Z inverse here, and here I have Z. So this corresponds to, there are uh, three, uh, I'm looking at, you know, the, the, uh, the parahorics, are param the maximal parahorics are parameterized by the so-called vertices of the Y lab. Group. And uh, one of the vertices is the origin, which will give you the group SLA, SL3A. The other two will give you maximal parahorics, which are of these kinds. These maximal parahorics are very important because uh, as, I will, as, as we go down, I'll mention why these groups are important in understanding even the old Narsimhan Sishadri theorem. So the other maximal parahoric is a group which the end, where the entries are of this kind. So these two are the two non, uh, the different, I mean, ha, ha, parahorics, which are not the standard parahoric, which is SL3A. And there's of course the so-called Iwahori, which I said, which is uh, obtained by taking the evaluation map from GA to GC by putting Z equal to zero and taking the inverse image of the Borel. So when I talk about Iwahori, all groups, all parahorics are studied up to conjugacy by the, the group GK. Okay, so these are the basic groups that we are looking at and uh, the bundles that we are going to consider in some sense will have transition functions in uh, these kind of groups. That's why we are interested in, uh, so these are the parahoric torsors that we'll be interested in. So as we go along, I'll mention them. Yeah. So what is the, what is the significant, one of the main theorems of Bruhatit's theory is that uh, uh, associated to each of these um, parahorics, there is a canonical group scheme, a fine group scheme, a smooth, a fine. I mean, we are in characteristic zero, so all group schemes are smooth. It's a sort of flat, smooth group scheme with, uh, with base spec, I should have said A, not spec A. Sorry, okay, my A is um, the power series ring. So it's like a, it's a small, complete discrete valuation ring. It's like you should think of it as an analytic disk on the Riemann surface. And uh, on that, I'm looking at a, at a group scheme now whose fibers outside, I mean, it's got a, it got a maximal ideal. <clears throat> outside the maximal ideal, the, the group scheme has fibers, which is the group G. And it's like a degeneration of the group G. And uh, it changes at the maximal ideal into a non-reductive group whose data is stored up in these parahorics. There's a way of recovering what is happening to the closed fibers, but it is all of equal dimension. Equal dimension. The, it's a flat group scheme. <clears throat> so this is the object that one is again going to study. And the A valued points of this group scheme is the group P theta K. And the beautiful theorem about Bruhatitz, normally if you want to look at group schemes, we, we have to look at not only the A valued points, but also B valued points for all A algebras B. But uh, these are special kind of group schemes, what Bruhatitz called as stuffed group schemes, determined as entirely by its A-valued points, which is the parahoric here. They're called ethophe in the French uh, manuscript. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we also prescribed, if you remember, the conjugacy classes at the element CI. And uh, so these uh, conjugacy classes, you know, if you remember, I was trying to say that the finite order elements of the maximal compact determine rational points of the while alco. So when I fix a representation rho from pi to kg and look at the images rho ci, I'm getting an ample m collection of m points of on the in the rational while alco, which I denote by theta tau, because it connects it's connected with the conjugacy classes and also the points of the alco theta. Each it's uh, theta i's. You know theta tau is the the, the entire tuple or ample of points. 
and uh, these are this is the data that i had at the marked at the marked points r which is the ramification locus of my quotient map from the upper half space h to x there is a, a small technical point that you know i mean there is a way to break up you know i'm looking at the upper half space to x the whole point of calling this as working with elliptic fixed points is that i can use uh, i can break up this quotient map into a, a free quotient from upper half space h to a group of uh, to a space y which is quotiented by the fundamental group of y and then a further quotient which is a finite quotient from y to x this is the setting of sishadri's pi bundle paper and uh, uh, things become somewhat simple because you're working with a finite cover here and algebraic geometry becomes more natural because if you're working with the upper half space algebraic geometry uh, will be a problem to carry out in a global sense so that's the reason why i assumed Mm, the elliptic fixed point story here of course you know one can once the definitions are made then one can also make them more for more general uh, real weights as well as i'll mention towards the end of the talk here so you can go to a, a finite cover to play the whole story the invariant direct image can all be done with respect to p now instead of the upper half space map q from h to x so the point, this map y to x is also ramified precisely at the same points r and uh, the order of, order of ramifications is also going to be defined by the numbers ni is that type yeah. <clears throat> so once this uh, conjugacy classes therefore are prescribed in some sense as i said the conjugacy class datum defines what is called the parabolic weight in the mehta seshadri theory so once these uh, conjugacy classes are prescribed we can now construct a global group object you know when, whenever we talk about vector bundles um, we are always looking at um, principal gln bundles and uh, a vector bundle is what is called an associated vector bundle to the principal gln bundle by the standard representation i some i mean vector bundles therefore um, some of uh, are a interface between you know sheaf theory i mean a vector bundle is also a locally free sheaf it also comes from a principal gln bundle but for other groups g we don't have any natural representation so the it's the principal bundle datum which is always there so when we talk about a, a, a g bundle mm, mm, i look at the group g as the constant group scheme g cross x on a on a space so the the geometric object that we are looking at which is the modified uh, story that means the the, the surprise uh, element in, in this story for general g is that unlike in the mehta sishadri theorem uh, or the narsimhan sishadri theorem when i look at the space of uh, homomorphisms from pi into a group g the g is not the linear group the data on the on the curve x is not merely replacing vector bundles by principal g bundles with parabolic structures but other more uh, a priori complicated objects but in some sense more natural objects which are called bruhartish group schemes which are global group schemes are fine group schemes of uh, on the entire riemann surface where at the at small disks around the markings coming from the ramification we put these parahoric groups associated to these um, the, these uh, p th uh, you know uh, these groups uh, theta i's and these these small g thetas are put around each of the small each disk around the ramification points with the weights given by the theta i is given by the conjugacy classes there and you glue up this small group schemes with the constant group scheme outside the ramification point so that is this group scheme g theta tau x so g this g theta tau x looks like g uh, at all points apart from the markings at the markings it will be like the closed fibers of the local bruhartish group schemes which will be in general non reductive so you will have this mm, this group scheme coming out of the data Uh, of r tau pi kg I mean, just by just by the sheer datum there and the uh, um so so what we have here is this group scheme um um uh, uh, is it a good time to ask if there are any questions or should i i've already gone bit far uh, actually balaji i have a question please Uh, so you are saying uh, for general G you have to work with this uh, Bruhartish group scheme. That's right. But for GLN, uh, somehow the group scheme picture 
is it, so what is it that the reason yeah there, there is a very beautiful reason there is there's something which goes back to the elementary device theorem in some sense in the if you look at the group gl and capital k that is if you look at matrices just the linear group it's uh with k entries as kt round bracket t the the only so the, the only maximal parahoric in that is the gl and a up to conjugacy i am um, so every parahoric in some sense can be made to sit inside the group of uh, a valued points of gln and therefore every parahoric uh, torsor can be seen as a, a vector bundle the moment the transition functions are inside gln a you get a vector bundle so it, they, therefore they can always be seen as a vector bundle with added structures but my my one of my important points which, uh, which i have tried to make in several conversations with sishadi as well is that even a parabolic vector bundle correctly speaking is really a torsor for a parahoric group scheme with a general fiber gln it just so happens that gln has a standard representation which is the identity representation which gives you therefore a vector bundle automatically mm -hmm. uh, and therefore you can view this uh, torsor under this or this homogeneous space under this group scheme also as a vector bundle with flag structures therefore it gives some sort of a false picture if you think in terms of for other g's because you, unless you fix a representation therefore you don't really get this vector bundle data or this uh, other data so in, that's the that's the subtlety which makes this group with general g different from other group even in sln you start seeing this picture yeah. so okay. are there any further questions from the audience okay uh, if there are no further questions, yeah. Balaji, maybe you can proceed. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So, so the the story then is that you know you look at in, just like in the classical case, you um, you have to define uh, instead of you know if you there is this work of Ramanathan which I am not mentioning here. The you know the in between after the Narasimhan Sishad the theorem for uh, GLN, the Ramanathan in his uh, very famous thesis. Uh, and this paper in the math annal in the mid 70s the thesis was finally published in 1990 but uh, this thesis was written sometime in about nearly the 80s i think early 80s where ramanathan um, constructed the modelized space of usual principal g, g bundles that is it's no no uh, no extra structures and this was constructed um, you know you you have to choose uh, sort of representations if you really wish to bring in the uh, the theory that uh, seshadri and narsimhan and i mean seshadri later on for the model like construction that's he uses the uh, hilbert schemes so you need to uh, uh, ramanathan has to use representations for the group g to bring in shift theory and then uh, construct the modelized spaces um, uh, uh, and when he has to improve that you know that in the characteristic zero case this is uh, whatever he constructs is independent of the choice of the representation and already the difficulty for other groups uh, the the general group started showing its visibility there it's an extremely uh, one of, it's a, te a technical masterpiece this paper of uh, ramanathan for the construction of the modelized space it is not at all uh, a straightforward uh, generalization of the old work of sishadri on unitary bundles it has to the 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 amount of algebraic geometry that is required to put everything in proper perspective is really uh, quite huge and uh, Ramanathan shows his mastery over Groth and Deek's work in uh, putting all the foundations absolutely impeccably clear there in that paper. So that's in some sense the place we start looking at uh, G bundle. Of course, um, um, that's for the principal G bundle setting. And uh, subsequently, I had a paper with Sishadri where we kind of simplified Ramanathan's construction, which could be in some sense adapted to even this parahoric uh, story later. Yeah. So. When we look at G bundles, the notion of semi-stability, I'm not really describing it. This is more like a gen the, the, the themes are too wide and uh, audience is very general. I'm not talking about stability and semi-stability. There are natural notions. We'll come up some notions when you do degenerations. So we can have a notion of semi-stability of G bundles. Likewise, we can have a notion of semi-stability of torsors or principal homogeneous spaces for these group schemes. So whenever I look at a group scheme, uh, on, a, on a space, I can look at principal homogeneous spaces under that, exactly like G bundles. <clears throat> the, 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 a principal homogeneous space will locally look like the torso. So these are 
uh, uh, that's all that we can uh, local in whatever topology here we have to be careful about the topology in this case it will be in what is called the ethyl topology so um, so we, we look at the space of uh, s equivalence classes s uh, was a terminology given by narsimhan and ramanan for seshadri equivalence the so called associated graded equivalence and that's what parameterizes the modelized space of semi stable bundles if you are interested in identifying it with the space of representations or the space of homomorphisms so you know this space mx g theta x so the story is uh, very pleasant that we start with the space of homomorphisms from the group pi to the group kg which is the maximal compact replacing the unitary group uh, k, uh, with the group kg and uh, i also fix a bunch of conjugacy classes each conjugacy class by just the structure of a, of the maximal compact gives you a point of the a rational point of the weil alco so giving prescribing m conjugacy classes for my representation gives me uh, the fixed datum of m points on the rational weil alco for the group g and this m this m tuple of points is what i'll call my weight for my for my group scheme and associated to this data of m weights i choose the marked points coming from the quotient space structure from h to x at each of these points i there is this god given group scheme associated to these points theta i i i, I put those group schemes around those points x i on the at the ramification i glue the the group schemes to the constant group scheme outside that i get a big group scheme on the whole of x carrying all the data of the conjugacy with it and now i look at uh, torsors now because that's what is going to have the moduli we require uh, the space of all representations will therefore uh, the representations with fixed conjugacy class each representation will give you a torsor for this group scheme the conjugacy classes fixes the group scheme which is the underlying topological structure in some sense and the moduli will be the the variation of the torsors the the holomorphic structures on the torch torsors will parameterize the the space of representations there's a real analytic structure on the on the space of representations and this space gets a, a, the space of like in narsimhan sishadri theorem the space of uh, s equivalence classes of uh, torsors here gets a natural structure of an irreducible normal projective variety and the dimension is a, a little complicated because we have to take into account the data of the conjugacy classes i have just put these numbers as the details are there in my paper it's a little uh, the the these numbers are very interesting numbers which carry uh, the 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 story about the the root structure of the group g uh, and uh, the the dimension g into g minus 1 is the dimension of the underlying g bundle modulized space so in some sense the added dimensions are the so called added parabolic structures normally in the vector bundle story you have the underlying vector bundles on the riemann surface x and the flag dimensions will add to it okay and uh, a similar phenomenon is what i'm writing here in the in the the expression for the dimension and so this is the isomorphism i mean the modulized space and the more important theorem is that that um, you know even though i mean you could abstractly start with uh, a, a parahoric group scheme on the right hand side and you can recover back in some sense a fuxian story so all such modulized spaces come from such space of representations that's the interesting part that is you know i mean i started with the theta tau but more generally you could start with any theta i at some marked points and you could look at a group scheme and define some stability and then one can prove that up to conjugacy each of those theta i's i mean you can vary them make sure that they are sitting inside the so called rational weil alco and then to each of the theta i's you can recover back a representation of a, of a suitable fuxian group so all this story can go back and forth in 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 some sense so so we started with the fuxian group but you can recover back one that's the that's interesting part there so you have the space of uh, representations of a fuxian group modulo the conjugacy and uh, the space of such representations is uh, isomorphic to the space of s equivalence classes of semi stable g theta tau torsors and so this is an homomorphism of topological spaces as i said the left side has a real analytic structure the right is a, a complex variety <clears throat> and uh, under these the, you can define the notion of irreducible homomorphism which is a very nice uh, natural generalization of the notion of an irreducible representation in terms of uh, a sure lemma you can talk about irreducible homomorphisms and they correspond precisely to the stable torsors on the other side a stability is naturally determined and all these theorems when you when you generalize it to the linear case you get back the mehta sishadri theorem 
And uh, let me just remark the history of this question that uh, this, several years prior to this work of mine with Sishadri, I had a paper with Biswas and Nagaraj where we studied this uh, in, in a Tanakian fashion, using some Tanaka categories following Madhav Nori's work. And uh, there, of course, the, uh, we did realize that in the G, G bundle story by Tanakian philosophy, we realized that we will never get a G bundle to get our objects on the on the right side of, which was the discovery that you know you have to go outside the G bundle category to go to study this uh, this data. The parahoric theme didn't occur there, so in some sense it was not totally satisfactory. As a, the the independent of all the semi-stability, the stack bun of such group schemes. When I said right G theta tau, it could be more any parahorics as I said. It was studied by Heinloth in his paper on uniformizations. Very early in the 90s, uh, you know, there was an attempt by Bosley and Ramanathan, which on hindsight uh, gives uh, a partial answer to the, I mean, on hindsight, because after the paper, my paper with Sishadi, we can go back and look at paper of Bosley and Ramanathan to recover some, uh, for some class of weights. And then uh, there is a paper by Bis myself and Biswas and Yashonidhi, uh, Pandey, where we, uh, as I stored, work with the real weight situation uh, and more in the differential geometry setting, by in the spirit of a paper of Atiyah Bhatt, Donaldson, Ramanathan, and Subramaniam. <clears throat> Ramanathan Subramaniam generalized it to the G case. So this is in terms of Einstein Hermitian connections. So that's my story for the parahoric. And uh, so this is uh, my, my paper with Seshadri, is, uh, on, which is, on which this whole thing is based is a paper which appeared in 2015. So the second part of my talk is on degenerations, which is uh, very intricately connected to this first part. <clears throat> so I have uh, yeah, about 25 minutes to go, I guess. So, so again, the same assumptions. G is simple, simply connected, L is the rank. So my, my basic picture that I'm working with here, the problem of degenerations is the following story. <clears throat> Sorry, my A sometimes is the ring, sometimes it's the space. Uh, I apologize for this mess up here. Capital K sometimes is the base, the open subset, which is the A minus the marked point. Sometimes capital K is the field. So I hope uh, it's not causing any confusion. Any questions at this point, Rajan? For the last part of my talk, nothing? Oh, no, sorry, I don't see the audience uh, the same, but not okay. from me. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Oh. I have a quick question. Yes, yeah. please. Uh, so uh, can we reproduce all of this if I choose to just pick the adjoint representation for some general group and try to work in the vector bundle center? What would I miss? Uh, you, uh, if you take the adjoint representation, you would get parabolic vector bundles. It's like an associated construction. You would not be able to recover back the story for G, okay? So see what happens is um, uh, if you, um, first of all, the adjoint group will be the natural one you would get if you work with the Lie algebra, not the simply connected group G. And uh, the, uh, the associated construction gives you some sort of a functor, but it's not, um, it, you, you will not, um, you will recover the, the uh, you know, when you look at the, the, the interface between G and GL of the Lie algebra G is the automorphisms of the Lie algebra and your transition functions will essentially land there. And that's the kind of object that you recover, not the G object. So the group G maps to the adjoint group G add, which sits inside the automorphisms of the Lie algebra. So there's some sort of an extension of structure group which is going on here. So you miss the story for G if you just work with the Lie algebra model. So the Lie algebra bundle will be something like a, a parabolic Lie algebra bundle, but it won't give you back the parahoric structure. Am I, did I answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> now, are there any further questions from the audience? Or, uh, if uh, anybody wants to ask a question, they can also put it in the chat box and then I can, uh, or, you know, we can raise it with Balaji at some point. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, Balaji, please go ahead. Yeah. I go to the second part now. The second, we don't, um, it's a, a, a story. As I said, I work now uh, with, a, with a, a, a family of smooth curves degenerating to an irreducible nodal curve. This is the picture that I have in mind. And uh, I work with this family of curves. I'm calling it CA over A, 
over the origin, it's the irreducible nodal curve C naught with a, with a node which is C. The general fiber CK is a smooth projective curve. Genus is G21. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's, that's not important. Uh, <clears throat> I could assume the, it's an elliptic curve as well here. Yeah. So, and for, for purposes, uh, technical purposes, I'm going to assume that the total space of this, of this surface now, see this CA, this family of C is, is actually a surface, an algebraic surface, which I'm assuming is regular over K. Okay, so it's like a smooth risk condition or over the, over the K, is, K is the complex numbers in this case. And uh, as I said, you, know, you can always, you know, we, we, uh, in the modern language, we can talk about the stack of uh, principal bundles on the generic fiber. I'm looking at a smooth curve degenerating to a nodal curve. I can look at the stack of G bundles I mean, without any semi-stability conditions. We can put semi-stability also. And then you can ask, how does this stack degenerate as the curve degenerates to a singular curve? As in this case, what's called a stable curve. And we could have more general stable curves, which we will come across in the, in the course of the lecture. So this is, a, this is, this is the basic object to study, the stack of G bundles on the generic fiber. Or you could look at the open substack of the so-called Ramanathan semi-stable G bundles or stable G bundles on the, on the general fiber, which is the smooth curve. Riemann surface and the Riemann surface is getting pinched in the boundary. And we want to see how the, the modelized space degenerates and whether we can construct something which is flat. Which the crucial thing in all these degeneration problems is whether we can const construct something which is reasonably equidimensional. And the closed fiber is also recoverable as a moduli problem. This is one of the features here. I mean, degenerations can be of many flavors, but the, the problem that Seshadri always addressed is whether when we, when we recover the problem, the, the limiting model I object, which we get either as a stack or as a space should be uh, again, solving some natural model I problem. That's the way it is. So the, the question is to construct a flat degeneration of uh, this. That means construct a global stack now uh, over for the, uh, over, over the, on the curve, on the surface CA over A now and uh, um, to be able to give a, a description of what's happening at the boundary as a moduli problem. Let me just tell, because it's a very gentle audience, let me tell the, because it's also about Seshadi's work, uh, the, uh, the question of constructing such relative uh, compactifications goes way back into early 70s. Uh, uh, there's this thesis of, uh, not some, sometime in the mid 70s, so, Seshadri had a student, Cyril D'Souza, who's uh, 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 PhD thesis, uh, this is a paper in the, yeah, in the local in the Indian journal here, is a very um, one excellent piece of mathematics which looks at the Picard uh, degeneration problem, which, uh, and this is, uh, which was followed up by the work of Altman and Kleiman later, and then a, a big, uh, big paper by Oda and Seshadri, which looks at a very general story. So there they're looking at the line model case, and this is the starting point of the story already. But nowadays, in, in the modern setting, we can recover all these uh, definitions of the say, uh, there are special features which come up, I'll mention them in this degeneration question. So they can be recovered from Simpson's construction, at least. But I want to say that the, the idea goes back to a, 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 a note by Meyer and Mumford in a, in a, in a Woods Hole conference. And um, the, the limiting objects, as says, one of the crucial points of all these degeneration questions is to be able to describe the limiting objects because I mean, constructing a flat geometric object is an algebra geometric problem, but to the model I problem also, also to recover the limiting uh, data as a model I problem. So this uh, limiting objects are what are called compactified Jacobians on the nodal curve C naught now. So these are, you know, you look at um, not only line bundles on the nodal curve uh, C naught, but to it um, add what are called uh, <clears throat> torsion free sheaves. And uh, that uh, then then um, uh, Cyril D'Souza proves that you know you can get something which is actually compact in the boundary and uh, you get a flat uh, degeneration. That's for the simplest case. But the other cases which were staring at I mean Mumford Asishadi always tells me that in Mumford's office uh, Mumford was handling this question or discussing and the uh, Seshadri it seems said that you can do this using GIT and then Mumford asked. So he just drew the dollar there, being a, being an American. I drew the dollar there and asked him, how would you handle this case if this were C naught? This is an example of a stable curve. And I believe uh, when Seshadi told me that he essentially I mean, solved this case 
in a few days time uh, where he, for the first time in the line model case, normally in the line model case, the so-called stability parameters don't really show up because it's a, it's a rank one phenomenon. But uh, Sishadi showed that if you take a singular curve, reducible curve like this, more than one component, uh, not like R curve C naught, but a curve like dollar here, then you have to fix what is called the polarization uh, on each of the components. And uh, a natural notion of semi-stability comes even for rank one objects. So this was Sishadri's uh, discovery and which led to the major collaboration of Oda and Sishadri, which is a long 90 page paper in the transactions, which uh, gets connected to toric uh, varieties and toric degenerations and whatnot. So that's the paper there. And I said uh, that, you know, we need to uh, um, attach torsion free sheaves uh, or what are called depth one sheaves uh, uh, in Simpson's language. And uh, of course, as I said, in the, if you work with a reducible curve, stable curve, then you have to do not only just work with such objects, um, uh, you don't require uh, semi-stability notions when your uh, curve C0 is irreducible, but if you uh, work with stable curves and then a semi-stable, uh, semi-stability comes even for rank one case. And let me quickly say that, you know, you have several components, suppose, on your curve C0, like this dollar case, say S components, then you can define the notion of a multi-degree and a multi-rank. All this is there in um, a, a big volume of Seshadi called, is in the asterisk journal on fibre vectorial, it's called. So you can define some sort of a natural slope for a sheaf, uh, which is uh, on, defined on various components. It is uh, some sort of a uh, na natural generalization of the usual bump forward slope. And uh, a torsion-free sheaf of rank one is semi-stable if something like this happens, because now your support of the sheaf can be on smaller components. So you do have notions of sub-objects and semi-stability. <clears throat> so this is uh, Sishadri's method to solve the, uh, and uh, which was uh, carried out in Oda Sishadri, the rank one case. The higher rank case, uh, its origins, I believe that uh, although Sishadri saw his work comes in the fibrovectoral, which soon after this, but Sishadri tells me that Giesecker was already looking at it in 1980s, uh, early 1980, where uh, he came to talk in TIFR on the uh, moduli uh, com constructions on uh, stable curves, moduli stable curves, the GIT construction, which is Giesecker's construction. So Giesecker constructed a moduli space in 1982 uh, for rank two and degree one, very special case, but he was interested in proving a conjecture of Newstead and Ramanan on uh, churn classes of tangent bundles. Giesecke constructed a degeneration as a tool by which he could uh, prove this by, very, by, by an idea of variations of hot structures on the modelized spaces. And uh, his construction was more special because in, in, in the earlier construction where torsion-free sheaves are there, the limiting modelized space is usually not such a nice space. In Giesecke's construction, they turn out to be nice smooth, uh, varieties with normal crossing singularities. Around the same time, as I said, Seshadri is work came in asterisk where Sishadri constructed higher rank problems, again, using torsion free sheaves. And um, uh, later, uh, for, after several years of limbo, I mean, this subject was, didn't make much progress. Uh, there was an in between a paper by Faltings in 1994, I, I wanted to mention here uh, in the next page. And late in, ni late ni in 1999, Nagaraj and Sishadri generalized this problem, this Giesecke construction for all rank and degree. And Ivan Kaus, uh, sort of almost independently, but dependent on the, somewhat dependent on the Nagara Sishadri construction, uh, made this stack construction for the GLN and obtained some sort of modular compactification of the, the group GLN. The, this problem of degeneration, Sishadri was also fascinated by the fact that it was closely intertwined with the, the geometry of compactifications of the group GLN and more generally the group G. Equivariant compactifications of group G come up naturally, as I'll mention now. So Seshadri's approach was to compactify a la Picard by adding torsion free sheaves. And uh, the semi-stability theory was via GIT. And the flatness of the degeneration becomes extremely technical. And it's a very local study reduces to a local problem, which is uh, looking at matrices of, uh, of this kind, uh, X, X and Y, which are R by R matrices and a parameter T, which is the uniformizing parameter for my ring A. And we look at the matrix condition x, y equal to y, x equal to t. This is the local singularity as a, at a torsion-free sheaf, which is not locally free. And uh, the flatness gets reduced to the reducedness of this ring, which is uh, proven, I mean, Sishadri gave a proof in asterisk, uh, proof due to Kausik 
in the rank two case, general the general proof thing was done using uh, some sort of Schubert geometry techniques by Strickland in 1987. And Faltings, as I said, um, reproved many, some of these things in 1994 and generalized these cases to the symplectic and the orthogonal cases, but his methods would not go to, through for the general G case. So this is the torsion-free approach. For the symplectic and orthogonal cases, Faltings was looking at uh, torsion-free sheaves with degenerations of uh, the symplectic form or the quadratic form uh, in, in either of these cases. And the techniques were more or less like the torsion-free approach and GIT could uh, bring in same stability. The local models that I mentioned here, I mean, one of the interests for Faltings to come into this was that this local object ZRA uh, comes up in the study of Shimura varieties of a certain kind and uh, Faltings was interested in, uh, these are precisely the, the local singularities of those Shimura varieties. And uh, therefore there was a natural link between the degeneration problem here and the degeneration problem there. And this was the connections and Faltings uh, did it as I said for the very special cases here. And for SL2, even for SLN, Faltings approach will not work unless SL2 is the SP2, which is the special case or SP1 and SP2. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, what is the basic idea? Uh, um, in, in all these cases, first, as I said, Sishadi's idea is to get the limiting objects by adding vector bundles to the uh, torsion-free sheaves to the nodal curve. But in the Giesecker approach, the basic idea was not to add torsion-free sheaves. That is, you don't keep the curve C0 fixed, but you replace the curve C0 with uh, different curves now, which are semi-stable curves. You know, uh, I'll, I'll be drawing some pictures here. So my curve CD is a, I mean, my curve C0 is the nodal curve. Its normalization is the curve, which is the curve opened up and I'm attaching a single P1 to the two points above the node. So that's the curve C1 and the curve CD, I'll have a chain of DP ones, uh, which attaches itself to the normalization of the, of the curve C0. And these curves CDs are what are called semi-stable curves because their automorphism group is not finite. It's got tori in them. The group, the curve C0 or the curve dollar curve that I wrote had finite automorphism groups. They were the so-called stable curves in the Deline Mumford sense of stable curves. And these are semi-stable curves with a fixed stable model, which is the underlying nodal curve. So Giesecker's idea was instead of working with torsion-free sheaves on the single curve C0, you work with a class of vector bundles on on a bunch of these curves, not bounded by this D, where D is in, in, uh, uh, in Giesecker's case was only uh, the rank of, I mean, which is, comes in the work of Nagaraj and Sishadri. Giesecker, as I said, did it only for the rank two case. Nagaraj, I mean, it was clearly, uh, how to generalize it was not at all clear. And it was a major work of Nagaraj and Sishadri, which uh, generalized it to all ranks and also the work of Ivan Kaus. <clears throat> so, one of the important themes here is to not just work with single curves. Um, I mean, uh, most of the model I problems one could have constructed just by working on single curves. So the, here, if you want to carry on the degeneration, we work with the surface now, as is obvious. But the basic surface that I started with was my curve, you know, this picture that I've drawn at the bottom where the smooth curve degenerates. And um, for, for purposes of moduli, one has to base change, you know. So I will write this, um, yeah. So this, uh, you know, your base ring A has to be base changed by D because if you're interested in some sort of evaluative criteria, you have to work not, not with the original curve CA, but also such base changes, which is which plays an important role. And when you do the base change here, at the node, uh, the ring locally looks like uh, a power series ring and three variables, X, Y, and T. T is the base, base uniformizer, but with an equation which looks like X, Y minus T to the D. This is what's called a normal surface singularity of a certain type called the AD type in the so-called um, Dinkin classification of singularities of surfaces. So the basic surface that we are looking at is CDA. And the idea is to desingularize or look at the minimal model of the surface, uh, which is the surface SD. And uh, you work with, instead of working with torsion-free shields on the nodal curve, you start working with vector bundles on the curve CDs not just the surface SD, but certain all kinds of blowdowns. You know, we want not just the curve CD, but all the curves starting from a single P1 to DP ones. This is the entire data. And uh, uh, all vector bundles are not used on this reducible curve CD. 
there is a list of bundles which comes up by geometric invariant theory for Giesecker and for Nagarat Seshadri. It's a very complicated, uh, I mean, it's a nice geometric invariant theory, but not completely transparent. You get a list of vector bundles. These vector bundles are such that on this reducible curve, now on the normalization, it's like a, the old vector bundle pull back the, from the nodal curve, but on the chain of P ones, we want, uh, you know, on a, there's a, there's a classical theorem of, of Grotendieck, or goes, which goes back to Birkhoff or even much, much earlier. Vector bundles on P1 are uh, direct sums of line bundles. So uh, much the same is holds for if you have a chain of P1s also. So if you have a vector bundle on a chain of P1s, it's a direct sum of line bundles. The condition of what vector bundle should come in the Giesecker list is what I call admissible here, which means that it's, um, you have on each of the P1s, you have the trivial bundle, copies of trivial bundle or the the bundle O1, which is the canonical ample bundle on the P1. Only those, we are not allowed higher uh, O2s and such things like that. So only bundles of the kind OAs and O1s and at least one O1 in each of the P1 should occur. And uh, the direct image should be a torsion free sheet. This is Giesecker's list of uh, what, what he calls, or Nagarat Sishadi's list of admissible bundles. And uh, uh, then the moduli problem is suitably defined in terms of these bundles and GIT is done and one can construct uh, with a lot of work, a, a degeneration for the modelized space with the normal crossing singularities. So uh, up to now, as you can see, there is really not much of a parabolic theory visible here at all. So and you, you start seeing interesting things when you go to the, the surface case G. So I'll, uh, the, the, when I write this ND here, I'm looking at the picture, which is the surface, like a tubular neighborhood around the, the singular curve CD. Therefore, I'm cutting off the entire, the, the smooth curve normalization into two small branches, which cuts the chain of P1s. So this is the picture. I'm sorry, I'm going a little fast here, but let me make the most important statement in my story here. As I said, you know, these conditions, the vector bundle on each of these P1s should have O's or O1s and it's torsion free. But uh, in the case of G, everything becomes very different. And that's why this, um... so Nagarat Seshadi's constructions for, is a, is a space which maps to the modelized space of torsion free sheets as a resolution of singularities. That's the important part here. And uh, uh, the fibers, uh, as Sishadri expected, would be the wonderful compactification of the projective general linear group over the so-called worst singularity. So all this fits into the Falting's theme also when we understand the local model principle here. Anyway, one of the important differences, as I told you, is that when you work with a general G, there is no torsion-free analog for G, because uh, unless you fix a representation, there's no way of talking about any sheaf theory there. So all has to, everything has to be done in the setting of the principal G bundle. And when G is classical, they come with nice representations, so Faltings could carry it out here. But if you work with an abstract G, the only thing you can do is work with torsors. And uh, as I write here, the Murphy's first law, Anything that can go wrong will go wrong in this case. And that's what happens. So you'll have to be carefully doing uh, the work here. So my one of the works that I did, inspired by all this work of Seshadri's and also um, uh, sort of, in, I mean, uh, inspired by his approach to the whole set of work, I mean, this whole problem with Nagarajan Seshadri, I studied this, I constructed this degeneration for G bundles. The difference here is the following. On this curve CD now, okay, which is the Giesecker curve that I was drawing with the, the normalization and DP ones, the new objects that come are group schemes now. So when my curve degenerates to this semi-stable curve, my group G also degenerates to a new group scheme. And the group schemes are more, there's what I call two BT group schemes, a higher, a higher order, higher dimensional analogs of group objects group schemes, where the, on the, um, uh, on the curve CD, um, uh, you have, you know, these are, these are these chains of P1s and you have non-trivial structures at the generic points of the P1s, which are parahoric in some sense and um, in a very natural sense. And um, you, you have a highly non-reductive group in the limits and the objects that of your study are uh, torsors under this group scheme, which are called admissible torsors for some reason that the torsor and the group scheme don't, are not very different along the chain of P1s. And the interesting thing is that um, a Giesecker torsor is now a triple. It is a Giesecker curve CD, a Giesecker a group scheme, which I am calling it's, uh, 
a had or a a Broadridge group scheme on the singular curve CD together with the torsor, which is an admissible torsor. And then one can construct a model-like problem like this. I mean, as I wrote here, we are having a surface here. I don't have a pen to draw the picture. So the, the zigzag points are, should be thought of as sort of eight one prime ideals on divisors. This curve CD is a, is a divisor on this surface. Just on the surface SD, the each of these curves, each of these, uh, the, the normalization and the P1s are divisors and you can give parahoric structures uh, at the, at those points and uh, the, mm, you have a group scheme now on this singular curve and you're gonna look at torsos. And it's a non trivial job to, uh, to construct the stack uh, to, I mean, I, uh, you are, we can then st construct the stack of Giesecker torsos, which is, you prove, one can prove that it's a good stack and it's flat over the base A and the more important thing is that the singularity is in the boundary is again of normal crossing type. Mm, it is uh, L plus one smooth components where L is the rank of the group G. And there is, we can again have a notion of semi-stability and in some sense, a complete answer uh, to the satisfaction of Sishadri could be done. Uh, my last conversation with Sishadri on the 15th of July last year was to tell him about the the kind of description of the of the, the limiting modelized spaces, and uh, uh, he kept telling, "Hello, can can you hear me, Rajan?" Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So my last conversation with Sishadri on on fifteenth of July was about a one hour talk that I gave him about all these things, and he was very keen and listening. And uh, towards the end, uh, he started saying, "Oh." I mean, it is in some sense, you know, after a lot of technicalities is over, he said, it was so simple. I missed this, I missed this, he kept saying with a smile and he was quite happy. And, but I didn't realize that that will be my last conversation with him. A couple of days later, he passed away. Uh, so that's uh, my collaboration. And you know, the parahoric thing comes there because I'm, in some sense, you know, if you work with the so-called normalization here, that's what I drew this picture. Uh, there are these two marked points which come and uh, my, my journey on parahoric torsos came because Sishadri wanted me to work on the nodal curve phenomenon in the early, I mean, 2005, 2006. I was working on surfaces and uh, somehow he wanted me to get into the story here. I was very reluctant, kind of dragged me into it. And um, the, he, he kept telling that, you know, at these two points, we need to bring in the theory of parahoric bundles if you really wish to address the G bundle story. And, uh, the para, and uh, there was no good theory of parahorics at that time. I kept telling that my work with this was an Nagaraj would work and he kept saying, no, it won't. Till we finally hit upon the right point. And, uh, but then this story got uh, shelved and we went on to develop parahoric torsos. And I started working on this sometime in 2014 and uh, it took about seven years to complete the story. In a very recent work with uh, Belkali and Gibney, they construct a, um, something like, I mean, instead of G, arbitrary G for SLN, uh, this is an important work because they do it over, not only over a single one parameter A, but over the model I, uh, MG bar, which is Delian Mumford compactification of all genus G curves. It means they're getting um, objects over other stable curves also. And they use conformal blocks, which is very much in the, in the spirit of this conference, except that I believe uh, the, the space does not have a modular description. One of the themes that Seishadri always pursued was to somehow get a modular description, but Belkali Gibney has also philosophically other descriptions, which comes from work of Satake and others, I believe. So with that, I think I'll, I'll close here and I'll thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji, for a very nice talk and for uh, all the historical comments. Uh, so now I request uh, any questions from the audience? Please address it directly. It's a bit too technical, I guess. I'll help it. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, sure, thank you. So uh, I, I would uh, love to know, so this notion of a wonderful compactification, it appeared in, I think, one of your slides. Uh, uh, what exactly is it? And um, so, uh, if I understood correctly, so the difference between doing the Gesecker approach and adding torsion-free sheaves is that 
Uh, the resulting object you get, you can think of it as some sort of resolution of the modelized space. So that's that's the picture. That's and right. somehow the fibers there are described by the wonderful compacted case. Exactly. Okay, so that's that's one question. And the other question is sort of more open-ended, like how much of this technology is known for Higgs bundles? Uh, Higgs bundles. Uh, um, so let me answer the first question first. The wonderful compactification is something like a minimal compactification, equivalent compactification for the group BGLN. Okay. When I say minimal, we just want also normal crossing singularities. We always blow up a little bit. I mean, the, the obvious minimal ones will, will, there is always, the minimal ones will always have more singularities because you'll be blowing down things. So wonderful compactification um, has, uh, it was done by De Concini Pachesi. It has a certain toroidal structure and uh, uh, it's a very natural compactification, which um, I would say that um, it's it's like a, I mean, if you take the if you take the group PGLN, you can always put it inside the projective space of the matrices, but you have to blow up the the singular matrices, and then you get the wonderful compactification. Okay, that's the PGLN story, and it's got a very pure root theoretic story. Not only it works, it doesn't work just for PGLN, but for any adjoint group. And it gives a normal crossing boundary with uh, a, a, a beautiful geometry involved there. And it's a, it's a very serious object of study. It gets closely connected to representation theory in many ways. The important thing here is that if you look at a torsion-free sheaf, a torsion-free sheaf is locally determined by the number of maximal ideals which come there at the node. So it, there's Seshati has a local description for all torsion-free sheaves. So it will be like, like direct sums of the maxim, maximal ideal at a single node. So that will be in some sense, if, if, if there is no free part at all, I mean, you could locally, look, it could look like copies of O and copies of M. Uh, so uh, a worst torsion-free sheaf in some sense, it's a worst singularity in the modelized space of torsion-free sheaves, look like all, the local type will look like M, M to the power N, where N is the rank of the vector model, where M is the maximum, M, M directs M, M, so many copies. The, if you look at the inverse image of that, in this, the, if you look at the Giesecker space uh, construction to the modelized space of torsion-free sheaves, the morphism, the inverse image of such a point is a, it can be identified with the wonderful compactification of PGL. So this, in some senses, uh, comes up in the in the philosophy or the paper of Faltings, a uh, couple of papers that Faltings wrote in the mid '90s, that if you wish to, in some sense, compactify the modelized space of G bundles, the reason is that if you look at the nodal curve and look at the normalization, uh, 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 an object on the nodal curve will become a, a G bundle with some extra data at those two points. And the extra data can be thought of in terms of compactification of the group. Okay, so one does expect some sort of compactification coming naturally there, but whether the fact that you get a wonderful compactification from the Giesecker construction is a very is an important thing. And in the paper that I have written, which of about which I spoke, a similar phenomenon seems to occur. And uh, there is a but there's, there's no torsion-free analog, so you have to intrinsically talk about the worst fiber in some sense. And there's no there's no base space over which we are talking. There's, I, there's no, I mean, there are some local models which, of which one can sp speak about the resolution, but there's no torsion-free analog for a G object, unless you fix a representation. But if you go to the cases like uh, Falting's case, like symplectic or orthogonal case, then what I provide is something like a resolution of singularities for those spaces also, because it works for any G. So th this is for the, and the parahoric comes there, that is the fact that you have O's and O1's as vector models mystery, mysteriously becomes a uh, some sort of a datum about parabolic structures in a, in a certain horizontal direction. You know, the, you have these P1s. Each P1 is, should be thought of as a divisor in a surface. So there is a normal direction for the P1. That's like a small, you can think of it like a small discrete valuation thing. It's a height one prime ideal. On that discrete valuation, it's like a parahoric structure. So it's like a parahoric structure, which I, I call it a 2BT theory, higher dimensional Bruhatic theory on the surface now. Which classical Bruhatic theory works only on discrete valuation rings. So this is naturally thrown up as an example. There's no general theory there, but it's a very good example of this phenomenon of degenerations, which figures in this problem. The case of Higgs bundles, there is one paper, uh, there is a paper by uh, an ex-student of mine, um, Rohit Verma, along with Kamgarpur and uh, uh, one more person in the IMRN, and they have, uh, which is studies this, uh, uh, the Hitchin fibers and such questions for the parahoric case. So there has been some work, but for the G case, uh, I mean, it's too, it's too far and a long way to go. Even for the usual case, it, this is the first attempt for the case, and I don't think there's any easy answer right now for the Higgs case. Uh, 
as far as I know. Does, does it answer the yeah, question? Thank you, thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker for a very nice talk.